Hi, welcome back. If you're new, my name is Dave Thomas, also known as 7shop9, and welcome to a brand new video. Um, this video has been, it's well overdue. Um, at Christmas, I've done two videos in one week, and since then, I was kind of a little bit burnt out, and I kind of wanted to take a little bit of time off over December, and a few weeks turned into a month, a month turned into two or three, and now we're in April, um, so this is well overdue. This video is going to be all about mono game. Um, since the new year, I've been dabbling a bit more with games, and in this new series, we're going to be building a small platform game reminiscent of the old retro games from the 80s and 90s, which I grew up with. And um, one of the first things that got me into program was actually um, games. Um, games programming, games hacking, um, extracting sprites from games, those kind of things I've done as a teenager. And those kind of led me to get interested in programming as an adult. So in this video, we're going to be looking at Monogame, how to get started with .NET Core, and start on the series of building the game, building things up very slowly from first rendering something very simple on the screen, right through to doing collision detection in platform games, and also um, modeling collision response, um, control on the camera to zoom in and out, and also animating sprites and characters on the screen. I'm also going to be revisiting some of the early videos like um, quotations and uh, metaprogramming. So those videos are going to be coming up as well in between these games videos. And also the last video from uh, the f -Sharp Advent, which was um, I can't remember now. Building a, a 6502 emulator with Fable. I'll probably also do that in a variety of different languages to compare them, like Elm, Reason, and um, ClojureScript. So I hope you're looking forward to all those. And let's get going with Monogame. So one of the first things we need to do is actually clone the Mono game repo. So we'll do a quick search in Google and we will go to GitHub and we will actually clone the repo. Now from the command line, this is relatively easy. It's just git clone and then the repo name. And when that is done, we will use the .NET new tool to create a template. As you can see here, there is no included mono game template. So we use a .NET new dash dash install and then if we give it a path within the monogame repo we can actually use the monogame.net core templates which are now included in the master build. So if we just browse to the path which is monogame project templates.net template monogame.templates.f sharp slash content. You can see here that we've got the two templates which come with Monogame. What we're going to do now is make a new directory and into that directory we're going to use the Monogame template to create a blank project. So to do this, you use .NET new, and then the name of the template, which is MG Desktop GL, because we want to create an OpenGL desktop application. So now that's created, we can now have a look. We've got content game one FS, program FS, and the project file. Now, if we open that with code, we are presented with this. You can see here we've got program.fs, which is a standard entry point. And we've also got game1fs, which has initialized load content, update, and draw functions. One of the first things I like to do is set up debugging. So click on the debug symbol and then the configuration symbol. Then click on .NET Core. After this, you'll see a blank launch JSON and an add configuration button. Click the add configuration button and then select .NET Launch, .NET Core Console app. Next, we need to replace the target framework with the target framework that we are using. 
In this case, this is Netcore App 2.0. Finally, we've replaced the um, template for the DLL with the actual DL name that we are outputting, which will be monogametest.dll. So now if we go back into debug mode and hit the play button, we get an error saying that the task build is not found. So now if we click configure task and create task and click on .NET Core, we can now create a task template for the build. We don't need to change this template in any way. If we switch back to the launch JSON, we just need to remove that right angle bracket off the end. Now we can try to build again. You can see that this succeeds, but the screen that's popped up is on my other monitor and a monitor full screen. So we'll just cancel that and I'll switch this back from full screen into a window so we can see the uh, mono game executable pop up. Try that again now. There we go. A nice blue screen. The first thing we're going to do is create a sprite type, which is going to have a position, a speed, a texture, a size, and an offset. The first thing we're going to add is a draw member function, which is going to take a sprite batch. Then we create a source rectangle using an offset from this record and its size and then we make a, a sprite batch draw call using the texture, position, the source rectangle and the color. You'll notice that we use a nullable op implicit function because source rectangle is a nullable and it's not automatically cast in F sharp. Next thing we're going to do is initialize a texture for the player's sprite sheet and also initialize a sprite for the player. We have to do this using mutable variables because of the way monogame is initialized. Now I'm going to add some content to the load content function. We're going to initialize the player's sprite sheet by passing a texture called skeleton and we're also going to initialize the player by initializing the record using position zero um, initial speed, the texture for the player sprite sheet, and also use an offset of 0, 1, 2, 8. This is so that we can use a sprite that's three columns down on the sprite sheet. I'm now going to add to the draw call to actually do a begin call in the sprite sheet, which starts a, a batch operation, and then we'll do a simple call to draw on the player record that we defined earlier, and then a call to the sprite batch end function. Next thing I'm going to do is add a simple function to read the keyboard state. So we'll call this get movement vector. We'll take the state uh, of the keyboard as an input, and then we're simply going to process the keys W and A for a diagonal, and the keys W and D for another diagonal, S and, and A for uh, one of the other diagonals, and then S and D for the last diagonal. Then we'll also check single keys down, W, A, S, and D. You can see this function is quite messy in terms of if else blocks. So we can also do this a different way using active patterns. And you'll be able to check out my Language Essentials video on, action, on active patterns, which I'll put um, in a card above. So now let's simplify things by using an active pattern. We're going to call it key down and we're going to take K is the key and state is the keyboard input state. So if a key's down, then we return sum, and if not, return none. So we can now use this active pattern to replace this get movement vector function. Let's delete all of that and replace it with a simple function match expression. So we can use key down as an active pattern and passing keys.w. Then we can use the and symbol to combine um, patterns and we can use another key down active pattern with a keys.a and so on. You can see that it simplifies the logic in this particular function quite nicely. Now let's scroll down to the update function and let's use the function we just created so that we can process the keyboard and move our player sprite in response to the keyboard. So the first thing we need to do is to create a movement vector. We do this by using the function we just created above and if the 
If the motion is not zero, then we use normalize on the vector returned. This is to make sure that the diagonals don't move any faster than the normal up, down, left, right directions. Now we need to create a new position. So what we'll do is we'll take the player's current position and then we'll add the movement vector times it by the player's speed and then also multiply that by the number of total seconds that have elapsed in this update. And this gives us a relative speed dependent on how often the update function is called because if the game is lagging behind then the update function will be called less often and the game time elapsed total seconds will be greater so a more movement will need to be applied. The next thing we need to do is to convert the player's size to a vector because it's currently a point and then create a minimum and maximum clamp. And this is to make sure that the player's sprite does not move off the size of the screen. So we clamp to the minimum size of zero minus half of the player's size. The maximum clamp is the bounds of the screen minus half of the player's size. Finally, we update the player reference with using the record update syntax to update the position to be the new position. <laughs> Before we run our game, we should add content to the mono game content pipeline. We're going to be using a skeleton sprite sheet, which I found, which was uh, open source on the internet. It looks like this. So what we want to do is copy this to our content folder within our project file. And then we use the mono game pipeline tool to add an existing item to our content pipeline. So now we select the skeleton and then I think you have to save this and reopen for it to update the content. Finally, what we need to do, um, what we want to do rather, is to rename this and just call it skeleton so that it can be loaded by the content pipeline within Monogame. Now I've hit the build button, it will prepare the content so it's optimized for Monogame. You can see there there's an XMB file which has been produced um, by the build process. This is all we need to do. If we try to debug now, we should get a nice blue screen with a skeleton on it. And if we move our cursor keys, um, the AWSD keys, we can move our skeleton around the screen and if we go to the bounds of the screen, we can find that the, the sprite never moves off the screen because of our clamp functions. So if you made it this far, why not subscribe to the channel, smash the like button as hard as you can, and um, also um, click the notification if you like to receive notifications on my next video. Um, please subscribe because it really helps my channel to grow and I will see you next time. Right, we're on record. The vibe done them back. You can't just do that. Why? Because I haven't even turned that on. <laughs> There's no point. <laughs>